So I talked to you a couple of months ago, uh, I got a general update off you uh, for Oxfam, Oxfam Ireland's work at this time of the year. Um, like, we're still in the same situation. The countries we've been talking about, um, some of them are getting worse, particularly the Sahel, I think, region. But also in South Sudan, like, people are dying every day of hunger, aren't they? Could you just give us an update, please, on the work? Thanks very much. Well, I suppose the past year has been pretty much an extraordinary year in terms of the level of um, humanitarian crisis and the sheer scale of the needs that people have in a wide range of countries. Um, if we look at South Sudan, for example, this time last year, you know, things on the surface seemed to be fine in South Sudan. Um, but then in December last year, a, a conflict um, uh, emerged after a falling out, a political dispute. Um, and that's had huge implications on, on ordinary people there. And I visited South Sudan um, during the summer where I saw huge levels of need. And um, unfortunately, there hasn't been a lot of funding for humanitarian work there. And that was evident to me also as well. Um, in South Sudan, um, people are facing a, a massive food crisis because um, because of the conflict meant that farmers weren't able to plant this year because many have been forced to flee their homes or have been too afraid to go out in the fields because of the threat of, of violence. Um, many people are living now in um, camps um, built around UN bases. Many uh, many of these places were never meant or designed to be um, camps for internally displaced people, but that's what they are. And I saw myself um, how difficult the conditions are for people there. In South Sudan, a lot of people are identifiable by which tribe they're from. Um, and unfortunately, this was a political dispute. has now become an ethnic dispute as well. And that means that many people are, are too afraid to leave the camps because of the violence they might face. And um, sometimes people then are, are really um, in need of basic goods like um, fuel, etc., which aren't being provided in some camps. Oxfam is now providing um, fuel and fuel-efficient stoves, charcoal, etc., so that people don't have to leave the camp. We're also um, providing clean water and sanitation and also um, providing things like solar lamps because many women, particularly in conflict situations, face um, high risks of assault. And I met women in South Sudan who um, told me about how they'd seen other women being raped and how the risk of sexual assault was very high in some of the camps, um, the shower blocks um, have been um, vandalised and some of the shower curtains have big slits going through them, um, so which have been done by people who want to watch women going to the shower. And um, it was very um, shocking to me to hear um, the situation being faced by girls and women in particular in South Sudan. So we're doing... Th- Things like providing solar lamps and other supports so that women can feel slightly safer in the camps. Um, but to contrast South Sudan with what I saw in the Philippines last year after the typhoon. Um, I, just tell us uh, first, uh, before we finish up talking about South Sudan, I, I, are you working like, for a political solution as well or are you, are you solely a, human, a humanitarian worker? Well, um, Oxfam's focus is... Um, in our humanitarian work is to provide um, aid and the services that people need but advocacy is certainly part of all of our humanitarian work so while we're you know on one hand providing the water and sanitation food vouchers um, etc in an emergency we will also be trying to um, look at ways of bringing about peaceful solutions so we engage with civil society in South Sudan and support their efforts to help reach a peaceful solution and we would also draw international attention um, on the issues being faced by people in South Sudan and make calls um, for action to be taken by um, influential um, organisations and countries to try and bring about a peaceful solution. And do you, ha- do you have like partners in, in South Sudan who you work with, like organisations like groups? Yeah, a big part of the approach of Oxfam and many other organisations is to work in partnership with local organisations. So um, we are working with local partners where possible, but um, in South Sudan in particular, all the programmes are Oxfam-run programmes. We do have a lot of uh, local people working with us and also volunteering with us, which is a really important um, asset. When I was 
in the camps, um, having that local knowledge was really important, not only just in terms of translating and things like that, but also t- really helped to give a context. When you hear it from a, a, someone who's from South Sudan describe the situation their country is facing, it's very powerful. And we would also believe that um, it's very important where possible that we have people from local areas working on our teams. And could you just... Um um, I know you you were in S- S- South Sudan over the summer there. I know. Could you just give us a summary, like, like f- for for example, Syria, like, was in the news for months, and I haven't heard of it much recently. Um, and just uh, like Gaza as well, I haven't heard much about Gaza recently. Mm-hmm. I think there's a uh, ceasefire at the moment. And could you just give us like a, a minute or two minute summary of each of the big crisis countries you're in, please? Sure, well, it's been three years now since the conflict broke out in Syria, but as you say, it's fallen off the news radar, but just because it's not um, on the news doesn't mean there's a chronic and worsening situation there. Um, The scale of the crisis continues to deepen both within Syria and also outside of it, with massive numbers of refugees, many of whom are living in very inadequate shelter, residing in neighbouring countries, about 10.8% million people are in need within Syria itself which is about half the entire population. There's also many many people, millions have fled to countries like Lebanon and Jordan um, and the humanitarian suffering overall is pretty overwhelming. About 191,000 lives have been lost and um, I think about 3 million people in total have fled the country. Um, Now refugees are telling us that you know um, the reason why they're leaving is obviously because of the conflict, but it's also that's also having a huge impact on day-to-day life. That you know the economy is deteriorating, the health system, the infrastructure of Syria um, is uh, is worsening. Um, that's one of the reasons why we're in Syria to providing clean water because the fighting has meant that a lot of um, key infrastructure relating to the water systems has been damaged. So we're repairing. Um, uh, piping and uh, those other kind of things that you need to have a functioning clean water um, so that people have access to that Um, and of course that in turn means that we're helping to prevent the spread of of waterborne diseases Um, according to the UNHCR um, more than 80% of Syrian refugees in in neighbouring countries are living in urban areas so they're outside the formal camps that we might be familiar with um, when the media covers the refugee story, I suppose they're kind of caught between relentless fighting and a very difficult humanitarian situation. So um, we're, we're working to provide help to people in, in Jordan and Lebanon as well through cash for work and um, also to try and help people get on their feet to know their rights. We help families who have fled Syria to get information on their legal rights as well. And um, as well as providing uh, water and sanitation support in in the big camps, um, and in Gaza, um, Gaza was very much in the news in August because of the um, the eruption in fighting there. Um, there's since been a ceasefire declared, but that doesn't mean that um, the situation faced by people has improved very much. In fact, the humanitarian needs are actually r- enormous there um, because that spell of fighting has seen um, the worst destruction in Gaza in decades in terms of its vital infrastructure like water systems, sanitation, health services. So what was already a very vulnerable population has now become even more vulnerable. About 100,000 people have seen their homes destroyed and about 25% of the population have no access to running water and that many schools and businesses, workshops have been damaged, farmers haven't been able to access their fields to plant new crops and um, so what we're doing there is we're providing safe water and we're also helping um, hospitals and medical centers to keep running and um, in terms of providing them with water and sanitation help and um, and I suppose you asked earlier about what we do in terms of advocacy as well and we're um, doing advocacy work as well to try and highlight the situation being, being faced by people in Gaza but also pushing for an end to the blockade and also a long-term peaceful solution that will give hope to people living there at the moment. Uh, and so okay, if we just talk about the Sahal for a minute, there are several countries in question in uh, West Africa um, 
uh, the Sahara stretches from one side actually of Africa to another I think doesn't it so but I think it's the countries in West Africa that are in crisis and there's something like seven countries in crisis and like I, I find it hard to believe that like like uh, 30, 30 years ago last week uh, we had uh, a famine in Ethiopia where a million people died but three years ago in 2011 like the figures quoted are between 50,000 and 250,000 people died of hunger it's unbelievable and it could happen again they could yes west africa is a place that's seen a lot of challenges in recent years and um the sahel region um, in particular has faced a lot of problems in terms of access to food and in 2012 um there was a, a massive crisis there um i suppose lessons were hopefully learned from the east africa crisis the year before and um some of the early warning systems um that were put into place did help to try and um stop the problem earlier than might have been the case in previous years but um as well as access problems accessing food there's also been conflict in mali and and it's actually quite quite a complex situation that's been faced by many countries in west africa and um i suppose again another story that's not really in the news but is actually impacting hugely on, on people living there um, now, when we hear about West Africa in the news, it's actually in relation to Ebola and the outbreak that's um, happened in uh, Sierra Leone and Liberia and Guinea-Basso. And I suppose um, very worrying and something that um, is ki- almost similar to the cholera problem that can f- crop up in, in countries like as it did in South Sudan um, back in May. Um, communities have been torn apart by the disease and many areas have been forced into quarantine and there's a huge fear there amongst people about about, about the disease and the risks um, that they're facing. Um, about 10,000 people have been infected with Ebola and um, almost 5,000 people have died. Um, we're supplying water and hygiene equipment and sanitation um, to help treat um, the disease and helping community care centres are also doing a lot of media work there um, in terms of publications, you know, loudspeakers and cars and things like that to try and um, make people aware of the risks and how to prevent um, Ebola passing t- to other people. We've also done a lot of local radio as well there. Um, if you just finish up, I'll, I'll, I'll definitely talk to you again over the next month about the Sahal and the Ebola, um, Sahal, the food situation. The famine hasn't been declared yet, but it could be declared next year. You know, we'll talk about it again before uh, Christmas, hopefully. Um, just fi- finish up, if we can talk, uh, we talked a bit about Ebola there. If we can talk just fi- finally about the DRC. Like, I know Mary Robinson was over there a few months ago from behalf of the UN. Is there any hope there, you know, any change in the situation, or is it still dire, like, in some regions? Yes, uh, colleagues of mine were in the DRC recently, and it's one of um, Oxfam Ireland's longer-term humanitarian programmes. Um, unfortunately, um things are still very challenging there there's been a lot of um conflict there and a lot of um factions have split and are now um it's actually one of the most complicated political um situations to even describe um but aside from what's happening you know in terms of different groups um in conflict with each other what we what is very clear and does not require much explanation is the fact that many many people have been forced to flee their homes are living in fear and women in particular um are facing um you know uh, sexual attacks um and it's a very very dire situation there and um, the infrastructure in DRC is very challenging um, a colleague of mine um was there who was there was showing me video footage he took of um, them traveling along um, a road there, if, if you would call it a road, and and the car got you know got wedged and almost fell over, f- uh, fell onto one side. Um, it's a very hard place to deliver aid to, and it's also um, not a situation that gets much publicity, um, and it's not really in the public um, domain, so to speak. So it's extremely challenging to try and deliver aid, but we are committed to doing that we do a lot of water and sanitation work there in particular and we hope to um highlight uh what's happening in drc at um an event and documentary that's going to be coming out in the new year 
And Sorka, if people in Ireland, our listeners here on Near FM, want to help EUs uh, in these countries, all these countries we just talked about for the last 15 minutes, uh, what are the best ways to do it, like tell us, please? Well, this time of year is a really important time for us in terms of fundraising, um, and people can, if they want to donate to um, our emergency work, can do so on our website or in our shops. Um, we also have... Um, uh, Christmas gifts and products as well, which um, including um, unwrapped Christmas cards where you can buy the gift of safe water and that money goes directly into our emergency response fund. Or there's uh, items like um, fair trade biscuits to socks to board games, um, fair trade items that are now f- this new range we have for sale in our shops. That's um, another way. We also sell iPads and refurbished computers in many of our shops as well. So. And there's lots of different ways to um, support the shops and also even just in terms of donating items to your local Oxfam shop and the sale of those items in our shops helps to raise money for all our work wo- worldwide. And if you want more information or to donate, you can get it on oxfamireland.org as well.